Good morning. As you have noticed, some of your essay assignments require you to back up your ideas with some outside sources. And if you recall one of our first slideshows, I mentioned that that is one of the major objectives of the entire course to have students demonstrate that they can use sources to back up their ideas and use good logic. However, you're writing essays. You are not writing research papers. So we are not going to go into how to format footnotes and bibliographies and use APA format or any of those things that you would do in a formal research paper or a thesis or a dissertation. That's not what we're about. We're about you being able to express yourself and rely on good ideas that you have found to back up your opinion. So when I talk about how to cite sources in your essays, you will not see anything about how to do footnoting or any of those bibliographic techniques. Instead, I want you to learn how to give credit to where you got your information, but to do it conversationally and just blend it into your writing so that it's just as if you and I were talking and you told me you saw some interesting show or saw some interesting article and you wanted to use that to explain an idea to me. So we're going to do it in that fashion. Don't think of this as being some sort of academic reference. Now, if it happens that in one of your other classes, you have to write some kind of research paper and you're not sure how to write up your references, you can still ask me about that because I certainly know how to do it and have read and graded all kinds of papers. So I can give you resources and assistance in how to do that, but that is not what we're doing in a regular English class essay. As a general rule, if you didn't see the thing happen, you need some kind of source. Now I'll talk about exceptions to that in a few minutes, but overall, unless you were the person on the spot you need to have some verifiable way of showing where you got your information. I'll tell you a little story. When I was teaching at Florida State, one of my classes was about communication theory. So a student said, could I use sign language as my example? Sure. Can I use baseball sign language? And I said, sure, that absolutely is a kind of communication. Because when a coach says to hit or bunt or take a pitch, or when the catcher is telling the pitcher, throw me the fastball instead of the curveball, all those signals are a kind of language. So I thought, well, this would be pretty cool. I want to see what she does with it. Well, one of the examples that she wanted to use was a game between FSU and the University of Miami. And the University of Miami happened to have been using binoculars and portable radios to spy on the signs that the catcher was making, relay them to the dugout, who would relay them to the coach, who would give the hitter an idea of whether a fastball or a curveball was coming. You can imagine that's a pretty good advantage. And my student was actually at that game. I still made her find a newspaper article about the sign stealing by Miami. Because she wasn't in the dugout, she wasn't listening to the radio, she didn't have firsthand knowledge of what was going on. So just find a story out of the paper or refer to a story that was on the TV sports cast the night before, that's fine. Because she didn't have firsthand knowledge. So you being a student, how much firsthand knowledge do you have of things going on around the world or in Washington or New York or wherever? 
How many scientific laboratories have you been in? How many mountains have you climbed? All those things. So as soon as you do something that is outside your personal experience, you probably need to find a good source to back yourself up. Now, you have written some personal experience essays where it asks for your personal opinion. And it's perfectly all right for you to say, my mother said this, or I had a cousin that happened to. That's fine. You could say, last time I was in Day Daytona, I saw a store that had just closed and it made me think blah, blah, blah. That's fine because you were interacting with those people or you were in that location and that's fine and you can use that. But when you need to bring up something that is historic or scientific or political, you probably need to find some kind of source that you can slide into your essay that says you actually found somebody who knew something about it. Now, how do you know your source is any good? This is what we call information literacy. And it's a tough thing that we teach in colleges and universities. We kind of need to teach it to the general public who watches the news and reads Facebook. But if you have any common sense, you can probably tell whether you got your information from a garbage site or a good solid research source. Again, an example from students that I have had. I've had students go online looking for information about the research paper that they were working on. And they thought they were finding really good information from, let's say, the University of Michigan. No, they didn't. What they found on a University of Michigan website were just the class papers of other students at Michigan who were no smarter than the students we have at Florida State. So all they really did was find somebody else's homework to try to do their own homework. Who knows whether that kid in Michigan knows anything more than what, what my kid did. So you have to be careful in looking at sites, even if it is from a government agency or a big corporation or a major university. So part of what we're going to do is look at sources and we're going to look at how to write them up and blend them into your essay. Hopefully this little guide will help you pick good information and be able to speak about it well. Essentially, when you write an essay, you are being a reporter. In fact, we often used to talk about students doing book reports. So they were doing the fact, uh, in fact, they were doing the job of being a reporter. They read a book and then they wrote what they got out of the book. And you're doing this when you read a piece of literature in the course and then you compare two poems or two short stories, what have you. You are reporting on what you saw and what you think it meant. So just like a TV reporter, you're going to answer some basic questions to evaluate your source. Who said it? What they say? When did they say it? Where was it? Why did they say it? Which is kind of a big deal. That's why I made that one last. But by asking these basic questions, not only do you have a good grip on the information for yourself, you will also be helping yourself figure out how to express it in your essay. We don't expect you to reprint the entire article that you read. We expect you to paraphrase it, to put it into your own words so that you read an article that was three or four pages and you boil it down to a couple of sentences that represent the main idea you got from it. That's all we're looking for. And somehow you have to tell me where you found it. So we're going to look at, I'm going to say, a semi-casual way of doing this kind of reporting. And I want to 
show you how to write it up as well as how to think about it both at the same time. So first we want to ask, who said this thing? Is this person a legitimate expert? And how would you know whether or not they were an expert? And how can you show whether or not they're an expert? So in this sentence, I'm referring to someone whose book I actually read and that I really admired. So Dr. Carl Sagan, astronomy professor at Cornell University, said that there must be some other intelligent life in the universe since there are billions and billions of stars and planets. Now that comes from one of his books that's almost 500 pages long. But I've kind of boiled it down to one sentence in my own words, the main point of what the book was about. That's our goal, for you to be able to take whatever it was that you found and render it down to a main idea. It's sort of like a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the elements of fiction and I said how hard it was to come up with theme. Well, in this case, the theme of his book was that the math tells him there's intelligent life out there in space somewhere. So the theme, the main point of the book or the article, very much the same idea, the same task. But now we want to look at how this sentence is written so that I am demonstrating that I'm referencing from an actual expert. First, I put in something about his level of education or his professional title. If you need to quote somebody about a military thing and you can call them a general or an admiral, put that in your sentence because that adds power and expertise. Notice I start with the expert's name, not saying I read this book. Who cares that I read the book? I care what the scientist said that I can put in my sentence. So I'm going to put my expert as the first thing, the leading item in my sentence. Now, the next thing I point out is that he has current and relevant work. So this guy ought to know something about it because it's what he does for a living. So he does this job, he has this education. So a couple of good points for making him an expert. And he teaches at Cornell, which is right up there with Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Uh, literally, they are in the same league even for uh, football and basketball. So. That's a major university that has a big name. He has an important position there and he has a high level of education on his subject. Now, if he had given a quote about ancient Egyptian architecture, I wouldn't think he was an expert about that. That's not what he studied. That's not what he does. That's not what his job is. So even though he's brilliant, He's not brilliant about everything, so let's use what he knows about space, not whatever he thinks about Egypt. So you see, you want to pull an expert that is tied directly to the thing you're trying to pre present. Now, what did he say? Is it a reasonable idea? Does the math back it up? Is it a controversial or unproven idea? So this tells me how strong is this quote or this main idea? Do I feel comfortable using it because it makes sense or it doesn't make sense? He was known because he had a bit of a Brooklyn accent that whenever he said billions and billions, it had a particular ring to it. And that was one of his phrases that um, he tended to repeat because he was working with large statistical models. So he's doing big math to talk about a big idea and these things match up well. Makes me very comfortable using him as an expert in my essay. So just in this little sentence, without going into a, a hundred things or rambling around, I've packed in here a lot of information where my reader could give credibility to my sentence 
And this sentence might be something that I'm building the rest of my essay around. Now, a lot of people know a lot of general information. Otherwise, they couldn't play trivia night or things like that. So where do we draw the line between common knowledge, stuff everybody just kind of knows, versus things that I really need to look it up and find somebody to say this for me because I wouldn't be an expert in this and general population wouldn't be an expert in this. So let me give you a way to think about that. Most people know something about Earth. <coughs> we know that the oceans are large. We know that Africa is big. We know that Australia is an island. OK, so if you said any of those things. I wouldn't need you to have a reference from the encyclopedia. I wouldn't need you to have found some famous geographer to have written a book about it. I'll give you those. I'll give you things like World War II happened or that it's cold in the winter. It, those kinds of things are fine because that is common knowledge, something that we can accept that most people know or would be OK with taking as a general fact. Now, if you look closely, at South America and Africa, they do kind of fit into each other. And there is a theory called continental drift that says that all the continents used to be packed into one piece, and then over time as the Earth cooled and the oceans rose, things broke apart and moved around. And in fact, earthquakes are proof that the land masses are still moving around. But I think you need a scientist to say that for you. Because that is a very specific scientific idea that's based on measurements and observations that people have taken. So yeah, find somebody that said that somewhere if you want to use that idea that South America and Africa used to be connected. So you see the difference between common knowledge and specific knowledge. So the specific knowledge, yes, find an expert. Now, just between us, there have been times when I have been writing and I wanted to use a fact that I knew. So I put it in my article and then after the article was done, I found a source where that could be proven because I kind of knew it. I know I had heard it. I was aware of this fact, but I didn't write it. The, my fingertips have that book or article or something immediately available. But I did make sure that anything that was a point of fact that everybody wouldn't know, I would find somebody who had already researched it or written it, something that I could refer to. So it's OK in the first draft of your essay to put in a fact that you think you know, but then go look it up and confirm it with something reliable. Now back to our main questions. When did they say it? So is this a recent fact or a discovery? Is this something about current events? Or is this some long established point that historians have known for centuries? Is this something that can change over time as we learn new things? Because sometimes science does advance and we we learn things that we never knew before and it changes the history books. It changes the science textbooks. So when a thing was said can be a part of whether or not we can rely on it. So our scientist Carl Sagan was a noted expert, books, articles, his stuff was in the Sunday newspapers. He was interviewed on television all the time. In 1975. That's the year I graduated from high school. So 
wherever science existed at that time may well have changed as we have more space exploration and we have better telescopes in orbit and we have sent more missions to the other planets. So maybe we know a lot more accurate stuff than we used to. Even in the 1960s, we thought Venus was kind of like Earth, might even be some place where people could live. Then once we actually had stuff landing there, we found out it was boiling hot and had a poisonous atmosphere. So, oh, okay, science can learn stuff and things can change. And what we used to know might not still be true. So, can his science from 1975 still be trusted? You may have seen the fellow on the left, Neil deGrasse Tyson who is probably the most popular astronomer today. He was even, uh, he did a bit part in the uh, Superman movie, Man of Steel. He's at the famous planetarium in New York City. Sagan was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in California. So they have equivalently high level positions. And in fact, they knew each other. Tyson, when he was a student, had been in communication with Sagan. Tyson and I are actually almost exactly the same age, but Tyson is the current guy who is working now. He's the guy who actually is redoing the first guy's TV show with updated science. So even though the guy from back in my day is my favorite science writer, if I was writing a paper today, I might want to use the guy on the left because that's who's doing it right now. So if it matters, if the point that you're making has changed, so if history or politics or business have changed, then maybe you want a more current source. We have lots of marking points in history. We talk about post-war to mean after World War II. We talk about post 9-11 to mean after those terrorist attacks, the world and politics were different. The world is certainly different since the internet rather than before the internet. So is your information affected by when that information was developed? If it's not, then you can use old sources. We still quote Shakespeare and Aristotle and these things because their wisdom is timeless. Other things, political and business things, they might change every year. So depending upon what you're writing about, when your source occurred could be a big deal. Where did they say it? Meaning, is this a legitimate publication or website? So if it happens to be the electronic version of some printed magazine or of a television network, so if it's CNN.com instead of CNN on TV, you know that there is editorial control, there are writers, there are technicians, there are supervisors. So before something comes out in one of those places, be it printed or TV or internet, there have been people who did quality control to check the math, check the facts, check the quotes to make sure that this was good stuff worth putting out. However, any dope can get a Facebook page and say whatever he thinks. So you can't necessarily trust that, well, just because it's online, it must be good. No, not necessarily. There can be fake pictures. There can be crazy ideas. There can be unverified facts. So we want to check this stuff out. Like I told you, I had students who thought they were quoting from a major university when in fact they were just looking at some other students' homework that had been published online. So you want to be careful. I just changed my sentence. I added the phrase in his 1966 book, Intelligent Life in the Universe. 
I've seen some of you do this where you say the Center for Disease Control said this and this. Great, you quoted the government agency. You said on this website and you give the website name. That's how you slide it into your sentence and do it properly. So what I'm telling you is not only do I have this particular expert, if you wanted to go find this book, you could look it up for yourself and you would see it, that what I said about it is true. So naming the book, naming the website, naming the article or the TV show, that's important. But you don't have to do it in a formal fashion. Just slide that name and date in there somehow so that it's comfortable in the way that you made your sentence flow and you'll be just fine. Here's a tougher one, and this is why I saved it for last. Why did this person say the thing? Are they trying to sell something? If I'm watching a commercial for Ford trucks, do you think the main point of that is to sell me a truck? Are they going to give me true information about their truck? Yes. Are they going to give me good information about Chevy trucks? Probably not. Are they going to give me bad information about Fords? Probably not. So we know that that commercial is going to be tilted in favor of the Ford truck because that's what they're trying to sell. When you read articles, is this being published to support one political viewpoint or another? When somebody is reviewing a movie or a TV show, are they doing it because they don't like that particular director or actor and they want to rip them up? So you have to be careful about the reason why something would get written. Now, coming back to our example about this book, something that's written in science or history or one of those kinds of fields, Often it is written strictly to put the science out in front of other scientists or the government does these reports because they have a legal obligation to show what they have been doing and how they have spent the tax money. So if there is some good public purpose that is fair to all sides, then you can feel pretty safe in the reasons why a thing got written. Now, in fact, this is a picture of my copy of the book. And you see on the cover there, it was only $2.95. If you tried to get one now on eBay, it'd be about $35, $45. But the reason science is trustworthy is because scientists publish it, put it in front of other scientists so that you can read their experiments, you can check their math, you can examine their theories, and by the movement of these ideas back and forth and being tested, we get more and more comfortable with what these conclusions are. But there's another important point about this book. When it came out, <clears throat> Russia was still the Soviet Union, and the Americans and the Russians were in a race for the conquest of space, racing to the moon, right? So the idea of science being neutral and science not having politics and that math is just math, that was a powerful idea. So you notice this book is actually written by two people. One was a Russian astronomer, one was an American astronomer. So together they said, let's just look at the math. Let's look at the measurements. Let's do the calculations together and put them in front of everybody. So not only did they show their science, but they showed that people from different politics can work together. So the purpose of doing the book, why they published it, when they did it, what they showed, to me, makes this a very trustworthy source. You can probably, with very little effort, if you go onto a website down at the very bottom, it probably has some link where you can look at 
about us. And it says who this organization is. Maybe it shows where they get their funding. Maybe it shows who they're affiliated with or how long they've been around. So it takes you 60 seconds to click on that and look at it and go, oh, yeah, these guys have been around for years and it's an international group. But OK, I feel pretty good with trusting this. So checking your source, feeling good about it, and then knowing how to express that this was a reasonable fact for you to use. That's what makes your essay strong and makes your point very convincing. Remember a couple of things from previous discussions. Direct order means that I think my audience will agree with my idea, would be in support of me. So I start with my strongest idea and then just keep adding details till I get to the end. Indirect, I don't know how my audience is going to take it, so I want to kind of preview my idea, give a fact, then a stronger fact, then a bigger, stronger fact, and hit them with my most powerful thing at the very end because I want to convince them. So remember, we have a video posted about that. We have a video posted about how to organize your basic five paragraph essay. In fact, your last letter writing exercise said a five paragraph letter, so it's the same way of outlining. And then we also have one about how to make your openings and your closing stronger, which goes back into how to leverage your pow most powerful sources. So I think if you just weave the information about the source you want to use into the sentence as if you were just telling me about a book that you read or a show that you saw. So you're just mentioning it, oh, by the way, but you slide in a few of these details like we have discussed, you'll be just fine as far as presenting your sources. And you're going to be doing more and more of this, especially as we go into next semester. So I would make sure that you know where this link is when I put it over in Canvas because you might need this information again, not just for the end of this year, but into the spring term as well. Do you have any questions about any of this information that's been presented today? If you do, raise your hand, unmute yourself, or uh, type something into the chat. Very good. I'm not seeing anything there, so I'm going to presume that uh, I must have covered this pretty well. I'll go ahead and preserve the recording and get it processed and posted up for you later today or first thing in the morning. Otherwise, in general, it looks like the course is going along well. I see students are being on a uh, good pace. I sent you all an email about that yesterday. So keep up the good work so that you can enjoy your holiday week without having so much school hanging over your head. All right. Thank you for your time, and we will talk again next week. Have a good day.